Our first speaker is Noah Mandel from Princeton University. Uh, his field is plasma physics, and his advisor is Greg Hammett. And he did his practicum at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in 2017. All right, thank you. Um, right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, thesis research, uh, studying turbulence and fusion plasmas. Um, so we'll start with a somewhat big question. Um, how can we save the world? Um, but so I guess we're all kind of trying to save the world in our own little way. So I'll be a little more specific. How can we make fusion energy? Um, fusion energy is the energy that powers the stars. It's the energy of the future. Um, it's a clean and limitless energy source if we can get it to, get it to work. Um, and it basically comes down to taking some uh, hydrogen isotopes like deuterium and uh, tritium and smashing them together, and then you get a lot of energy out of this. Um, it's easy enough on the sun, but uh, it's not so easy on Earth. Um, so the way that we try to do it is we, um, we heat up uh, these gases uh, so that they're really hot and they ionize and they become a plasma. And then we can confine them with magnetic fields um, in this uh, donut-shaped reactor called a tokamak. And we can heat, heat them up to temperatures like the surface of the sun. Um, so here's a little cartoon of a tokamak. Here's like a cross section. So you have like um, the core region where you want all your heat to, to stay so that you can get fusion going on in there. But inevitably there will be some turbulence and the heat will start to leak out. Um, and you'll get, uh, the heat gets out to um, the edge and then the scrape off layer. The scrape off layer is um, a region where the magnetic field lines aren't actually closed. Uh, they actually end on some um, like plates called diverter plates. And so one thing that um, is important to study in the scrape off layer is how much heat is flowing along these uh, field lines. And um, you need to know if you're going to melt your plates, basically, because that would damage your reactor and that would be bad. Um, and then it also, the scrape off layer in the edge also sets a boundary condition on the core. If your edge is too cold, then you're not be able to get your core hot enough. Example. Okay, so here's another um, picture of a tokamak, and now we're going to focus more on the scrape off layer. Um, so you can see you have a field line. It starts at a diverter plate and it wraps all the way around, and presumably it ends at some diverter plate up here. Um, and something of interest in the scrape off layer is these um, field aligned structures that are known as filaments or blobs. Um, and so uh, blob dynamics is an important area of study in the scrape off layer. And so we can actually image these things in an experiment. So what I'm showing here is um, a movie from the gas stuff imaging diagnostic on uh, NSTX, which is a tokamak at Princeton. Um, and so these are real-time turbulence movies. Um, the data is taken using a fast camera at something like 400,000 frames per second. And so what you're seeing here is you have a, a field line, and there's a, a blob that's aligned with a field line. And so there's a gas puff. And so when the, uh, the plasma moves through that gas, it uh, ionizes the gas. And so you can see um, the ionized gas. It, so the intensity of the light is like, goes like the density or something. So you're basically seeing um, this blob has some elevated density moving into like the vacuum region. Um, so we want to be able to um, study and simulate uh, these kind of dynamics. And so we, what we do um, is we use this thing called dryer kinetics uh, to describe uh, this turbulence. Um, so what does this thing mean? Well, it's kinetic. Um, you have a phase space that has both spatial dimensions and velocity dimensions. Um, that's because there's uh, kinetic effects in plasmas like Landau damping that uh, can't be modeled by um, fluid. And then it's gyro because uh, ions in a background magnetic field like to gyrate along the field. And um, this is a high frequency motion, and we really don't care about that high frequency. So we can just average over the, the um, gyro orbit, and we can actually reduce the dimensionality down to just three spatial dimensions and two velocity dimensions, um, which is a significant saving going from 6D to 5D. Um, so what is the gyro kinetic equation? Um, it's basically a hyperbolic PDE. It describes some type of evolution of some phase-based density of particles that I'm going to call F. And so here's uh, the equation in conservative form. Your, uh, your particles are being advected at some velocity r dot. So this is like the, um, 
particles are moving along the field at some uh, v parallel, and they also have some drifts perpendicular to the field, uh, and they're being accelerated by forces like the um, electric field. And um, one important thing is that uh, you have to make sure that um, you're maintaining conservation laws. This is a Hamiltonian system. Um, and so you can show that integrals of this equation give conservation laws for particles and energy and stuff like that. Um, but it's important to note that these conservation laws are implicit. Um, there's no explicit energy conservation equation like you might have in some uh, fluid model. So you have to um, be careful about uh, integrations and things like that. Okay, so uh, how are we going to discretize? Um, so we're using the discontinuous Galerkin method. Um, this is a class of finite element methods with discontinuous basis functions um, used to represent the solution in each cell. Um, and so this is a highly local, highly parallelizable method. It allows higher order accuracy by um, going to uh, higher, or higher order polynomials in each cell. And um, it can enforce local conservation laws, which is a big plus for us. OK, so we're going to take the gyro kind of equation. I've dropped the, the collisions and sources on the right-hand side. And I'm going to transform it again um, so that this, uh, I get it just a total um, divergence that contains both the configuration space and the velocity dependence, and some just phase-phase um, advection velocity alpha. OK. So to do dg, we use a, a weak form of the equation. Um, we divide the phase space into cells. We multiply the equation by some test function, and then we can integrate by parts over that cell. And so this is the weak form, the dg weak form that we get. And so you can also already see uh, how you can get um, conservation laws out of, out of this. So you can get particle conservation by taking w equals 1, and then so you're just integrating f. The phase space integral of f is like the, the total density. And so you can show that that uh, will get conserved. Um, similarly, energy conservation by taking the, the basis function to be h, uh, the Hamiltonian. And so these conservation laws require um, these integrals to be computed exactly. Um, you can't have any aliasing errors. And so if you wanted to do that with uh, quadrature, exact integration with quadrature, um, it would get pretty expensive. It would scale like the, the cube of the number of basis functions. Um, so we want to try to do a little bit better than that. Um, so the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a, a modal uh, form of dg. We're going to use a modal expansion of, of f and some other quantities in each cell. So f is expanded in some, some basis. And then so the fundamental operations are tensor products. So this is like the volume term in the dg weak form. And so if you expand out f and alpha, you get some uh, tensor that I'm calling T, um, and this is a, this is a tensor product. Um, if you do this naively, it's no better than quadrature, um, but we can be clever and we can choose our basis function to be orthonormal, and that makes this uh, tensor T sparse. Um, so we're going to use Legendre polynomials as those in orthonormal basis functions. And then we're even cleverer, and uh, we use a commuter algebra system uh, called Maxima. It's kind of like Mathematica. And then we're going to compute these sparse tensor products and generate uh, solver kernels. Um, so what does it end up looking like? Um, so this is uh, maxima generated uh, C code. There's thousands of lines of code like this in our, in our code. There's no loops. Um, so this is just, this, is just this, uh, this tensor product. Uh, and I'm, we've only written out the elements that are non-zero. Um, so just a quick uh, calculation. So uh, for 5D gyrokinetics, piecewise linear basis functions, uh, there's 32 total basis functions. So if you did it this way, you would have something like 160,000 multiplications and something like 100,000 additions. By taking advantage of the sparsity, we reduce it down a, a lot, uh, quite a bit. And so um, our code is actually about 30 times faster because of these innovations over um, a previous version that used uh, Gaussian quadrature. Um, and then uh, this method of um, generating uh, solver code from a Maxima script makes it really easy to generalize to different dimensionalities, polynomial orders, add new terms. Debugging is actually easier because you just have one script that generates all your code. 
Uh, it's pretty nice. OK, so now let's get to the actual simulations. Um, so remember this picture. And so we're going to try to simulate um, the scrape off layer. So we have a simulation that's field aligned. So we're going to simulate this whole field line um, from the bottom diverter plate to the top. Here's the cross section again. So we're going to basically simulate this, this green region. And so here is, uh, so this movie is showing kind of this region. And so we're seeing like these um, blobby structures that are, that are propagating out radial light outward. Um, those are driven by um, an interchange instability from curvature. And so comparing to the, um, the NSTX GPI movies, we see kind of similar kind of structures um, with these blobs moving out. And um, this is a really good sign. Um, right, so now um, something that I've um, been contributing to this project um, is including electromagnetic effects. So typically, scrape off layer modeling um, is just electrostatic. So it's neglecting magnetic perturbations. Um, but really, your field lines should be able to bend. And for example, you can have alphane waves. Um, these are kind of like um, the field lines became, behave like taut strings. And you can have uh, this, the uh, field lines get plucked by like plasma motion. You have a tension force from the magnetic field. And the, the string mass is like the plasma that's on, attached to the field line. And so um, at higher beta, uh, beta is like this ratio of uh, like the density to, to, the, um, to the tension force, uh, you can get larger magnetic perturbations. Um, OK, so this is like the coolest movie that I've ever made. So I'm going to try to explain it <laughs> carefully. Um, so you're going to see in the background the same kind of blobby structures that are going to propagate out. Uh, and on top of that, I've plotted um, the field lines, the total field lines. So at the beginning of the simulation, you have field lines. So this is along the field line in this direction. And then in this plot, you're looking kind of down the field line. So in this uh, simulation box geometry, the field lines are straight to begin with. And then when you uh, start the simulation going, they start wiggling around. And you can see that blobs that come out, they kind of push around the field lines. Um, and so remember when I said before that um, at higher beta, you can have bigger perturbations. So like when there's more density, you're at higher beta. And so those field lines are getting pushed more and more. Um, yeah, this is, yeah. And this simulation only took 10,000 core hours, um, which, was, <laughs> which was really cool. <laughs> Um, so this, and this is also the first ever uh, electromagnetic, uh, gyrokinetic simulation of the straight buffler. Um, other codes have had trouble with this because of numerical issues or computational expense or things like that. Um, and then, so you can ask, does uh, electromagnetics actually uh, do anything? And the answer is yes. You actually do need to include these effects. Um, it's not enough to just uh, use the electrostatic approximation. Um, the particle of transport is actually reduced um, when you electromagnetic effects are included. And so this uh, makes the, um, the density profiles flatter. Um, and so if there's less transport, you could get like um, the heat that's flowing along to the diverter plates. Uh, it could be like um, more narrow, and you could um, damage your, your plates quicker. Um, right, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to the CHGF um, and collaborators at Princeton. Thank you.